Uh, before us, you see uh, arrayed a cast of, of uh, thousands to pick up from where Professor David Nassau got us earlier. There are representatives here from many of the institutions that Carnegie founded and which still, um, I think you're in the wrong place. Yes, sorry. Could you two go across there and you two at the end come across here? <laughs> Because we were going to have this, the grand design of this, you see, is to have the, the Carnegies in a, in a group here. I don't know what you call a mass of Carnegies. Is that a, a herd or a... <laughs> yes. <laughs> and I think, I think this is, uh, is quite a, a unique occasion, I think, to, to see them all up there and uh, share with us, as they will do shortly, their, their insights um, and their thoughts about their organizations and where they might go in the future. Um, as we all know, the, the dynamics of international conflict have changed enormously since Carnegie died a century ago. So what are the biggest changes? How have the Carnegie institutions adapted to them and what might be their role in the future? These are the, the sort of things that we're, we're going to look at. Um, this double panel consists of um, five high-level represent representatives of uh, five Carnegie institutions. Uh, one here with um, a peace-building practitioner and uh, an academic. And we're very sorry not to have the third member of our panel, Mary Calder, who uh, was going to speak to us about the, the, the changed uh, world dynamics, but has unfortunately contracted a problem with an eye and has had to uh, go off to hospital. But we have on the Carnegie uh, panel, we have uh, Dr. Uh, Joel Rosenthal, President of the Carnegie Council for Ethics in International Affairs. Joel, just wave your hand so we see you there. He's also adjunct professor at the Bard College Globalization and International Affairs Program in New York City. Um, second from the end over there, Dr. Eric Isaac, President of the Carnegie Institution of Washington, which is also known as the Carnegie Institution for Science. Eric joined just this summer from the the University of Chicago, where he was uh, the Robert A. Millikan Distinguished Service Professor of the Department of Physics. Sir John Elvidge, right at the end there, uh, is Chair of the Board of the Carnegie UK Trust. He was Permanent Secretary to the Scottish Government from 2003 to 2010, now works in an advisory role with the OECD and several governments in Europe, China and North America. Uh, in the middle, Thomas uh, Valasek, director of Carnegie Europe, um, the European branch of the Carnegie Endowment for International Peace. Thomas's research at Carnegie Europe focuses on security and defense, transatlantic relations, and Europe's eastern neighborhood. Before that, he served as the permanent representative of the Slovak Republic to NATO. And uh, along at this end, Jeannie Donofrio, Chief of Staff of the Carnegie Corporation of New York. Now, Jeannie's uh, been there for 24 years, serving Presidents David Hamburg and now Vartan Gregorian. She works with the President on all aspects of management, strategic planning and oversight. And in, in our other half of the panel, if you like, um, invited to reflect on these Carnegie roles are two eminently qualified observers and practitioners of peace building in the modern world. Tom Duval, a senior fellow of Carnegie Europe, specializing in Eastern Europe and the Caucasus region. I'm not sure whether he's poacher or gamekeeper, and we'll find out uh, yeah. shortly, but he's worked extensively as a journalist and writer in the Caucasus and Black Sea region and in Russia. And Brendan McAllister here, senior mediation advisor at the United Nations and mediator and former victim Commissioner in Northern Ireland. Brendan's been actively involved in peace building in Northern Ireland since 1974. So we'll look forward to hearing from, from everyone in a moment, but first we're going to hear from someone who isn't here uh, in the flesh, but who has found other means. Vartan Gregorian, president of the Carnegie Corporation. He was described earlier as the godfather of the uh, Carnegie Institution's family. Uh, and he's uh, kindly sent us a few words by video. Let's hear what he has to say now. Yeah. 
Good afternoon, Your Royal Highness, Excellencies, Ministers, Diplomats, Ambassadors, Scholars, Fellow Colleagues, Peace Activists, Clergy. It's my great honor to welcome you to this conference. I extend my apologies for not being there with you, but to tell you that we at Carnegie, trustees, staff, and all our constituents are with you today. Andrew Carnegie did not want just charity, he wanted to do permanent good in the world. And that should be our motto, our aim. During his lifetime, he established many foundations, organizations, and institutions to complete his vision. He was not a unilateralist or parochial. His vision included the palace, his vision included the Carnegie Corporation of New York, Carnegie Council, Carnegie Institute of Science, Carnegie Mellon University, Carnegie Hall, Carnegie Heroes Fund, Carnegie Trust for Scotland, Carnegie Trust for UK Universities, and on and on. But most importantly, today's meeting is about The Hague, Palace of Justice, which is home for Carnegie's vision, who believe that war is a waste for humanity. Peace Palace is 1913. I stood for hope. We have an obligation not to allow that hope to be destroyed, Andrew Carnegie's vision to be destroyed. We all have to guard the legacy of this institution, and this institution has to provide a convening power, which it has, for all kinds of groups, not just from Europe and the United States, but Asia and Africa as well, in order to show that rationality, hope, cooperation and international and universal values are, have still meaning and solutions. So let's always do, all of us, in our own way, our own methods, to do justice to Andrew Carnegie's expectation and in, injunction to us. And I quote, peace wins her way not by force. Her appeal is to the reason and conscience of men. And that summarizes why we're meeting you today. Today, we're not gathered here just to celebrate Andrew Carnegie's legacy and those of the institutions that participate and are here. We're here today also to issue a challenge uh, to all the others who are doing the same thing, to join us, to cooperate. In isolation, there is no solution. In cooperation, there always are solutions. We have to work with every other organization which have the same mission as we do, namely progress, reason, peace, coexistence, and solution of humanity's problems through dialogue, negotiation, understanding, and not dictat. Good luck to you. We're very proud, all of you, but we're also proud to be in The Hague, proud to be in Netherlands, proud to be associated with legacy of Queen Wilhelmina and not the Dutch who have helped the Peace Palace going through all these years as a tribute to Andrew Carnegie's legacy. Thank you very much and good luck in the conference. So that was Vartan Gregorian extolling the, the virtues of organizations of common mind and purpose working together, something that uh, I hope we will go on to discuss what does peace building together mean. And uh, of course, we're delighted to have his uh, chief of staff with her, her boss's voice booming above her here, uh, <laughs> Jeannie D'Onofrio um, from the Carnegie Corporation. Uh, just to explain what I'd like to do is to hear first from our Carnegie people on what each uh, institution was set up to do and, and very briefly how they're carrying out that remit today. I, I know it's a tough order to get into just a few minutes um, because every one of them is engaged in a quite extraordinary range of activities, but um, we, we hope just to get a sense of, of what we're starting from here. And uh, then I want to ask Tom and Brendan to consider uh, what they think are, are the main challenges to the Carnegie institutions and indeed encouragements in the, the changed global landscape. Um, we'll have a little back and forth on that and then I'd, I'd like to come to you uh, for your questions and, and please be thinking about this as, as we go along. And 
indeed as we're talking, if there's something that, that occurs to you that you'd like to, to throw in that is pertinent at that point of the conversation, then do raise your hand and it may be that I can, I can come to you at, at that point. Um, so let me start with, with you, uh, Jeannie, the, the uh, Carnegie Corporation. Last, if I remember correctly, from David Nassau's book, to be founded, the, the biggest, the richest, we well, don't want to brag about it, but yeah. <laughs> yes. <laughs> um, so Tell let us me, what you're about. Okay, sure. Uh, thanks, Ali. Um, first, I want to say it's an honor and a pleasure to be on this panel. Um, and uh, Vartan, as you, you saw him, he's very sorry he can't be here. Um, so in addition to that video, he sends his warmest and uh, personal greetings to everyone. Um, let me begin by giving a little bit, um, talking a little bit about Carnegie Corporation, uh, beginning with my initial impression of the organization. So when I first started at Carnegie um, more than 20 years ago, for, I went there for, to have an interview with uh, the president, at that time it was David Hamburg. And my first impression when I walked in the organization was, um, this place is so quiet. It's, I was working at the Museum of Natural History where people were making eight noises behind, you know, in front of my, my, by my desk. So I'm like, this is very quiet. And there's like paper everywhere. What's going on? It's just piles and piles of paper. Um, and I said, you know, if I scream into this hallway, I'm just gonna hear myself. Um, so, uh, so what was going on? What were they doing? And I really didn't have much knowledge about the underpinnings of the foundation world. So um, <clears throat> quiet as it was there, it was really an organization bustling with activity. Behind all that paper, I found a vibrant community of employees. Um, there were scholars and diplomats, educators and administrators. Um, there were field experts in education, democracy, health, child development, and peace and security. They were spread over two floors. The staff, they were working diligently, carrying on Andrew Carnegie's mission that he had set for the institution at the turn of the 20th century to advance and diffuse knowledge and understanding. You see, prior to the corporation's founding, <clears throat> Carnegie was doing everything he could to spend out his fortune, which by the way, at the time of his death in 1919 was around $350 million or about $9.3 billion today. So up until his death, he uh, spending his money on, he built libraries, about 2,500 of them around the world. He set up pension funds for educators and workers. He helped to purchase about 7,500 church organs. He established more than 20 Carnegie institutions <clears throat> and trusts, representatives to sit on this panel today. And of course, Andrew Carnegie helped pay for the construction of the Peace Palace. Sorry, I have to read a little bit. Um, <clears throat> all of this was exhausting work. And beginning, um, and being in the last third of his life, he started to run out of steam. And he did not want to leave the arduous burden of giving money away to his wife, Louise, should he, should he predecease her. Thus, the remaining bulk of his fortune of 145 million, he set up the Carnegie Corporation of New York in 1911. We are not a corporation. We are not a, not, we are not a for-profit making business. We are a not-for-profit grant-making foundation. Simply put, we give money away. We use the moniker corporation because the foundation had already been used for two other organizations, Carnegie Foundation Peace Palace and the Carnegie Foundation for the Advancement of Teaching. So for more than 100 years, the Carnegie Corporation had continued on, on with Andrew Carnegie's goal of doing real and permanent good, real and permanent good in the world, and that we should create ladders on which the aspiring can rise. Can I just ask, um, mm -hmm. to advance knowledge and understanding, mm -hmm is very, very broad mm -hmm. and wide. How have you interpreted that as an organization? As an organization, we are spread across a number of programs. So we have an education program, democracy, international peace and security. And so we, we spread the knowledge through um, a carefully uh, staff that's aligned with a strategy um, that when we work with our grantees and we cooperate with them through our grant making. So you, and, and you give money away as you were we saying. give money away, yes. Yeah. Uh, Wonderful. We give, uh, on, uh, most recently, I think in uh, 20, this current year, we, our grant budget was $150 million. It's, it's actually small potatoes compared to something like the Gates Foundation. Their annual budget is $6.5 billion a year. So um, we're, we're ranked, I think, fourth or fifth of the 25 top foundations at the bottom. So we're small potatoes. Joel, ethics. Right. 
Yes, thank you. First, I want to thank everybody as well. I want to thank the organizers, Dr. Bott, Eric, Angus. Thank you so much. And I also have to thank um, Dave and Nessa for that wonderful reminder of, of why we're here. Inspiring. So ethics, I'll be very brief. Um, so I had an encounter, um, my first encounter was actually in 2001 when we had the first, meet, first modern meeting of all of the Carnegie institutions. We met in New York for the first uh, awarding of the Carnegie Medals of Philanthropy, and that's when I met many of you. I had the opportunity to sit next to William Thompson, um, and it, w this was a, a, a bonding moment that will live forever. Uh, uh, great-grandson of, of Andrew Carnegie, and um, we were sitting there, and we each had two minutes to tell what our organizations were about, and we were threatened that if we went through the red light that we would never be invited back again. But William, that stands here as well. You yeah, know we're yeah, still yeah, here, yeah. so thank you. <laughs> um, but ethics, so um, David mentioned we were the last organization founded. We were founded in 1914. And so the real question is why another organization? Why a, a, an, an institution devoted to the moral, ethical, spiritual dimension of, of international relations? And um, partly it, the answer was um, given this morning. Um, the young student who said, uh, we have to pay attention to what we plant. Right? What we reap is what we, we'll, we'll reap what we sow. Uh, and we have interpreted our mission to be an educational mission. Uh, that it's important to have a global educational effort um, looking at the moral, ethical, spiritual dimensions of international relations uh, in light of, of the peace legacy. This institution, uh, Carnegie Endowment and many of the others are focused on the political project. And the political project towards peace is essential, of course, but it needs to be complemented by an education project. And that's really how we see um, our role. And what we do today is we convene and publish. Uh, we do a lot with multimedia, and we're trying to find ways to actually answer that question that was asked to the students this morning of how best to engage particularly young people on two major issues. One is uh, democracy itself and some of the threats that we see to democracy uh, in Europe, United States, and in many parts of the developed world. Um, and also the case for internationalism. Um, that basic idea that Carnegie stood for, that we should be internationalists and that it was in our interest to do so. Uh, that's also being threatened. So those are the two big themes we're looking at. Thank you very much. And and Thomas, you're, you're um, the, Carnegie Endowment for International Peace. You're not the whole of it. You were a bit worried that it looked that way in the program, but you're, you're the Europe end of it. What, what, what do you do? What's your, your remit and how have you interpreted it? Indeed, uh, let me begin like others by thanking the organizers. What a wonderful opportunity and, and a venue also to, to meet in. Well, very well thanked now. I think yeah. you're fully thanked, yes. Um, I shall, I, I do run the Brussels office, but let me, let me say a few observations on behalf of, of all of uh, Carnegie Endowment. Um, and let me also bring the, uh, the regards and of the president of the Carnegie Endowment for International Peace, uh, Ambassador William Burns, who couldn't be with us. Um, we were the institution most recently, or the one that uh, Professor Nassau ended up describing the birth of. So in fact, in many ways, he made my job easy. Um, so let me very quickly recap. The endowment was started with a, the briefest of missions, really, um, to hasten the abolition of war. Now, Andrew Carnegie was specific about the path, less so about the means. Let me explain. He made very clear in a letter to the trustees that he believed that the quickest and fastest way to abolish war lay in bringing about the international treaty that would outlaw war and make arbitration, binding arbitration, the law of the, uh, of the land or of the, of the globe. Um, he was less specific about what exactly the process of influencing ought to look like. The way we've interpreted the process of bringing about um, either an arbitration treaty or some sort of a system of uh, institutions and treaties that would preserve order and stability. The way we interpreted it is by creating essentially a global think tank, not just a think tank with a heavy advocacy role. Uh, you will find us, and I will uh, say a few examples, you'll find us engaged when the, uh, when the going gets tough. But we are primarily, uh, what has emerged after the, um, this more than a century of Carnegie Endowment, is one of the world's largest nonpartisan policy institutes of its type, of its type with offices in uh, Beijing, New Delhi, Beirut, 
Moscow, Brussels, Washington, and the newest one in Palo Alto, not coincidentally, because, and that brings me to my second point, we believe that the mission that Andrew Carnegie set out for us, or at least for our part of the big Carnegie family, is in some ways in trouble um, for all the reasons that have already been mentioned before me. Um, technology is, is part of the reason why we believe that the cause of uh, peace and stability may be in jeopardy. To state the obvious, um, technology can be a force for the good you wouldn't have the sort of credible verification mechanisms in many arms control treaties were not for the technological means that have enabled it. Equally, technology made it to the wrong ends. Um, look at Blitzkrieg um, and, and the combination of, of uh, armor with new doctrine. Look at the damage it wreaked on this part of Europe in the 1940s. So we believe technology, we believe the breakdown of the unipolar global order, we believe the, uh, uh, the increasing use of war as an almost routine matter of diplomacy and a routine tool of diplomacy is an incredibly warning sign. Let me end by saying, what is it, after having looked at these new sources of disorder, what is it that we as Carnegie Endowment have drawn from that? What's the implication meaning for our work? We've just gone through a major strategic planning review where we really took sort of a roots and branches, a rethink of what we do and how we do that. We decided that what's in order, what's called for, is a laser sharp focus on the four major drivers of disorder. You could sort of link anything in the world to the um, to the order and stability, but we thought Andrew Carnegie's original vision is best served by focus on four different things, quickly lay them out. One is disorder, to state the obvious, that's looking at conflicts, what's causing them, what are the, uh, what are the sort of drivers and motivations. I'm lucky to have my colleague Tom Deval on this very panel with me, one of the world's best experts on, on the troubles in a former Soviet uh, Union. Uh, and I could go on. We have regional expertise in all the key hotspots of the world. Thank you. I might just finish your, finish sure. your, your, your other few points and very quickly. I'll be very quick. Uh, the other three um, uh, areas of focus are uh, governance, uh, for the obvious reasons. Um, the, if you have a well-governed space, country, region, it can cope with conflict better than the less well-governed ones. Geoeconomics, that's sort of an odd-sounding one, but basically what we're looking at is the way that promotion of economic interests by corporations and companies and, and states plays in bringing about order or disorder. So the interplay, if you will, of economics and, and order. And last, but very not least, uh, is, uh, is uh, the, uh, the issue of uh, technology itself, which I have, oh sorry, I think I've already mentioned uh, technology. Let me spell the fourth one, which is of course, um, um, govern disorder, technology, geonomism, geonom and governance. That's okay. what the four Thank things you. we Thank you very much. I'm sorry to, to hurry you along. No, no, I just no wanted to hear from, from uh, as many people um, as we can quickly. And uh, Eric, from the Institution of uh, Science, you, <laughs> you've only been in the job two months, so um, you, you'll time. have been on a fast learning track, no yeah. doubt. But uh, you, you started out as the um, Washington Institution and sort of evolved into science, is that right? Well, um, so first, let me just thank again, since we haven't thanked you enough. <laughs> I do want to add one piece to what David Nassau said, which is uh, W.C. Fields named uh, Children and Magicians. Let's name David Nassau. It's really bad <laughs> yeah. to follow David. It's a great speech, David. Uh, well, the Carnegie Institute for Science, from its very beginning, actually, was about investing in people and instruments. It's really about doing our own research. So we've invested in, uh, Carnegie originally intended, uh, uh, investing in scientists to really explore discovery. That discovery ultimately leads to change, but it is very very long-term discovery. So in some sense, we're looking at peace 50 years from now if we can invent and discover today. Uh, but from the beginning, we've been focused on several real core principles. First of all, it's intellectual courage. Our scientists are extremely able to take big risks and be very courageous. Uh, and they're able to do it with unfettered curiosity, which is very important. And I think uh, Carnegie originally realized this when, it, when universities were developing in this country in the early part of the last century, that it needed a place where people were unfettered, didn't have to teach necessarily if they didn't want to, but could really explore really important things. And what's ended up coming out of that, and I'll just list a couple of examples, and then I'll also get to the present. People like Edwin Hubble, who discovered the first galaxies outside of our own galaxy, which led him to discovering the expansion of the universe. People like Charles Richter, who discovered, you may know, the Richter scale, which is how we measure earthquakes and seismology in the world. People like Barbara McClintock, who actually had very, won a Nobel Prize, actually, for her, her work on patterns of genetic inheritance. So 
these kinds of uh, independent, very unfettered type of research that goes on inside Carnegie today, it's been going on for 100 years. The change in name, by the way, was just because it, it, it was better to identify ourselves as scientists. We've always been science. But looking forward, the kinds of things we're doing are really following, as scientists do, the most important problems on Earth. And so if you look in, we do three things in space, Earth, and life sciences. We're looking at the interfaces of those three. I want to give one, maybe two examples, because they are connected back to the idea of peace. The first is examples of studying, uh, let's call life, let's call them uh, plants and biological life in extreme environments, either at the bottom of the ocean or in deserts. Uh, to understand how they survive. It turns out at the bottom of the ocean by hot vents, there are biological species that survive, no light, uh, and they live off of rocks. So how does that happen? So you may ask in the audience, why should I care about species that live off of rocks? Well, understanding that and understanding why plants can grow in the Mojave Desert is very important if you're thinking about the survival of the planet with climate change. I mean, if you're looking at increased amounts of desert, how are we gonna provide food? So one day this kind of research could lead to the kinds of genetic and biological understanding that will help us carry us through 50 years from now, maybe 20, 30, 40, 50 and, and years. And indeed feed into uh, yeah. peace building. And feed because, into peace because building. Because the, yeah. the, the threat to the planet right. is all part of, right. of the reduction of exactly. resources and so on that leads to war. Now I want to give a second example, which you're going to look at me and say that is related to peace. We also have a world leading program in astronomy. We've got an observatory in Chile, which was purchased over 50 years ago. Big, be beautiful piece of land. We've had research going on there for 50 years, as I've said, but we're now building one of the world's largest telescopes down there, which will enable us to look deeper into the universe, even further back than Hubble even imagined, but also start looking at knowledge, whether may give us knowledge about whether there's life on other planets. So you can tell me, well, how, what does that have to do with peace? It's my opinion, a conjecture. If we actually did, and this could happen in the next 20 or 30 years, if we actually did discover life on other planets, or at least have the knowledge it exists, that could really have a big impact on who we are as human beings. So mm -hmm. I think things like that, really big ideas, discovery science, that defines what mm -hmm. Carnegie is now and what it continues to evolve towards. Thank you very much. And last but not least, uh, Carnegie UK and uh, John Elvidge here. And your office is just a stone's throw from where um, Andrew Carnegie was born in Dunfermline. Indeed. Uh, indeed. And in the context of, of this gathering uh, and the focus on peace, we're, we're perhaps the equivalent of uh, the question that one of the young students asked earlier in the afternoon. You know, why can't you bring your peace palace to my local ice cream shop? Because I'm, I'm fairly sure that when the UK Trust uh, was created by Andrew Carnegie in 1913 when he was so busy uh, creating other institutions directly related to peace that he wouldn't have thought it particularly probable uh, that our work would intersect uh, with work around, uh, around peace. And for much of our history, uh, I think that would be broadly true unless you take the view that fulfilling our mission to advance the well-being of the masses uh, in the United Kingdom uh, and raise uh, people's sense of satisfaction with their lives and their material prosperity is itself a, a precondition for avoiding war and uh, encouraging uh, peace. Uh, but the thing I wanted to uh, concentrate on uh, very briefly uh, was something which, from our perspective, was accidental uh, a, centenary, uh, a, a century after we were uh, founded, which was that we were, having made the evolution from being a grant-giving organisation, um, uh, much as Jan described about the, uh, the, the New York Trust, to a public policy organisation that then collaborates with people in the, in the implementation of, uh, of those ideas, uh, we were doing something fairly routine for us, presenting some thinking about uh, well-being as a framework for the activities of governments uh, and uh, focusing on outcomes uh, as a way of uh, building a relationship between governments and their citizens in Northern Ireland. And on the back of that, um, political representatives of the, the two main parties representing the divided communities in, in Northern Ireland, the Democratic Unionist Party and Sinn Féin, asked us to become involved 
in facilitating uh, discussion amongst elements of civic society in Northern Ireland uh, about what it might mean in a Northern Ireland context to pursue that uh, uh, that kind of uh, that kind of thinking, um, and following the initial success uh, of, uh, of 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 that work, in which the trust was playing a convening role um, rather than a directing role, um, that process began to move forward until in 2017, following the last elections, those two parties chose to adopt a, a framework of that kind as the, uh, as the basis for uh, government in, uh, in Northern Ireland. Now, for close students of the UK, it's unfortunate to say the least that other issues um, have temporarily, we hope, uh, incapacitated the political government of, of Northern Ireland. But civic society remains engaged in that process, and we're told... Uh, that government uh, in its non-politically directed state continues to follow the, the political route map that was laid down through that process. So there are some grounds for optimism that um, slightly accidentally we have come to play a role in helping uh, a, a community divided by civil war to sustain the process of coming together that began with the politically negotiated um, uh, peace agreement 20 years ago. Thank you very much. And we'll hear more from Brendan about Northern Ireland in a moment. Could I ask you, just before we go on, do you think we could, we could sort of spread out the, the chairs a bit? Because I'm just very aware that people over here you're, you're, are, are seeing your backs. Thank you. Thank you very much. So that everybody can... Uh, we can see these wonderful faces here. Um, Tom, if I can, we've had here a, um, a very fascinating um, sort of overview of mm. the, the breadth mm. and indeed the depth mm. of, of what the Carnegies are involved in. Now, we had hoped to hear from, from Mary Calder about um, some of the specifics of the, mm. the changing dynamics of international peace mm -hmm. and conflict um, today in the world, but um, Thomas has, has mentioned some of them, and right. you know, I, th I think we can all use our imaginations for a lot of these. What's your take on that, the, mm -hmm. the, the changed environment in which the Carnegie institutions now operate, and your right. reflections on that? Sure. Um, well, thank you, Terry. I, I should begin by saying I'm kind of half in, half out. Um, I'm a Carnegie scholar, but I'll try and be more out for the purposes of, of this discussion. I should also say, being here in Holland, I'm also half in, half out, despite my Dutch name. I'm actually British. My father was born not many miles from here, but um, came to Britain in 1939. So if you speak to me in Dutch, I, I am afraid I'll have to apologize and, and say don't. Um, I, I can't answer you. Um, I think um, it is a challenge. I think um, and it's, I, I think it's amazing that the Carnegie institutions are still functioning so well and so effectively uh, a century later, but clearly it is a challenge to kind of refashion your purpose uh, a century on. And, and I've been reflecting on, on how um, a century ago peace was a, was a kind of a leitmotif of the political vocabulary of the day, and it isn't really anymore. I think, I think it's been marginalized over the last century as a, I mean, we use the word peace, but not in the kind of political vocabulary of the day. And I've been, I've been thinking about that and the fact that, um, of course, um, I also worked in Washington with the Carnegie Endowment and, you know, and, and we are founder, as has been already quoted today, you know, saying to the, to the board, you must hasten the abolition of war, the, f the foulest blot upon our civilization. And in the same letter, he actually says that when you've achieved that, then you've got to have a board meeting. When you've abolished war, you've got to have a board meeting to discuss uh, what's next on the agenda. Uh, uh, which, unfortunately, that, that board meeting obviously has yet to happen. Um, but looking at the history of the Carnegie Endowment, um, I was struck by the you know, statesman founded it, um, and they were p both peace activists and statesmen. You know, Elihu Root, Nicholas Butler, 
went to the Paris Peace Conference um, of, of 1919. They both won no Nobel Peace Prizes. James Shotwell, all, all of these three actually have rooms named after them in the Carnegie offices in, 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 in Washington. James Shotwell was at Dumbarton Oaks and helped draft the UN Declaration of, of Human Rights. Um, these were kind of statesmen talking about peace um, as part of their kind of everyday endeavors. We know that the, the two world wars obviously knocked back the Carnegie legacy, um, but I would also say the Cold War also had a very negative effect um, as someone who's um, actually studied in the Soviet Union and has lived in that part of the world. I think the word peace was tarnished by the Cold War because the, the, the communist bloc adopted it in a rather cynical fashion and there are peace palaces all over um, the communist world and, and peace conferences and peace movements um, which were really only facades for, for quite an aggressive um, power. And I think um, we're, we're living a bit with that legacy. Um, and it's interesting that you know the Helsinki Conference of 1973, the, the organization that, that created, they talked about security and cooperation. The Western partners couldn't bear to use the word peace. We, we ended up with, we've ended up with the word security being the kind of leitmotif of international political vocabulary. Um, and I think that's a shame, and, and, we, um, and we can see why that's happened. But I think, it's, I think we should be th thinking, and the Carnegie institutions should be thinking, how to reclaim the word peace. Um, I guess the other context it's, it was used was, it was as a, uh, in the kind of counterculture of the 60s. You know, John Lennon, all we're saying is give peace a chance, which you know, is great, but um, also sort of for many people in, the, um, in ordinary p political life kind of boxed it as a, as a kind of counterculture thing and, and great to have it as a counterculture thing, but, but that doesn't mean that, that the rest of the political establishment can't um, engage with peace as well. Um, and interestingly, the, the only places that, that where I do find the word peace used, uh, as someone who studied a lot of conflicts in, 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 you know, in all the former Soviet conflicts in places like Chechnya and Armenia, Azerbaijan, Georgia, etc., um, and Northern Ireland actually is, is people use the word peace when they've experienced war. I mean, they, they, you know, people aren't afraid to use the word peace if they, when they're direct victims of war, and we shouldn't forget that. So I think this is the, this is the challenge, is to how to kind of reclaim the word peace um, in a very kind of direct, um, political, everyday application, um, not as a kind of counterculture slogan. Um, and of course, there are new challenges. Um, it's a great shame that Mary um, can't be with us because she's a huge expert on, on the changing nature of war. Um, and uh, something that really has to be tackled now is that war is basically now waged more by non-state actors than by state actors. Um, you know, if we look at Afghanistan or Syria or um, um, or you know North Africa, um, Central Africa, it's it's non-state actors rather than states who are mainly waging war, which which obviously poses a different kind of challenge. Um, and just lastly. Um, um, I think we have to address the issue of peace and justice. Um, sitting in The Hague, where we are looking at the Hague in Academy of International Law, the Peace Palace, um, the dream of arbitration. Um, and it's interesting how um, I think this theme has, has been a kind of, again, a leitmotif of um, how much should peace and justice work together, how much can, but then some conflicts, um, you end up having a peace with that, with that um, you get to the peace, but you can't get the justice. Um, you know, Bosnia, you had to deal with, with Milosevic, um, for example. But just, just to close, um, this is, um, I think, another legacy of, of the Carnegie Endowment for International Peace is uh, Raphael Lemkin's book, um, um, Axis in Occupied Europe of 1944, where he coined the word genocide. Um, and um, I'm actually not a great fan, <laughs> even I'm being iconoclastic here, I'm, I'm, I'm not a great fan of that concept. I think it was a noble idea which hasn't actually uh, worked very well. I think, I think international justice needs to kind of move on from the genocide convention and deal with, w with all sorts of issues, but uh, maybe we shouldn't, we shouldn't go there today. But just to say that um, I think peace and international justice um, is, is um, really a very, very important topical theme. Um, sitting in The Hague in a month in which the, 
the White House has directly attacked the International Criminal Court as being illegitimate. Um, how do we um, respond to that challenge? Okay. Thank you. I'm, I'm going to come back to you to ask what, you're, what you specifically think, then, the role of the Carnegies mm. um, as, a, mm -hmm. as a body, if you like, as a, as mm. a potential as a body, as a potential partnership might mm -hmm. might be. But before we do that, Brendan, um, as a, a practitioner of peace, somebody who's had to mediate in that very, for a long, long time, intractable and bloody conflict in Northern Ireland, um, what, what do you feel are the, are the challenges and the priorities right now uh, with reference, perhaps, to the kind of things that we've heard that the Carnegies are involved in? Thank you, Sally, and good afternoon, everyone. Uh, I'm thinking about the uh, formation of the peace people in Northern Ireland in 1975. It was one day in West Belfast, uh, an IRA unit uh, ambushed a, a British Army foot patrol. There was a gun battle, and as the IRA men escaped in their car, uh, one of them was shot and fatally wounded, and he crashed his car into a woman wheeling a pram killing the woman and two of her three children. Uh, that was in 1975. Now, there was, there were, we were used to a level of violence then, uh, but there were some particular deaths that had a pathos to them that particularly upset people, and this incident did that. And the sister of the dead woman with another uh, woman formed the peace people and called people out on the streets. And for a few months, People were coming out on the streets across Northern Ireland in their tens of thousands in the hope that the collective moral outrage of the people expressed in great numbers would somehow shame people engaged in violence out of their violence. And I took part in one of those demonstrations in my town. And I remember as we walked around at the edge of the town, the IRA set off a bomb in the vicinity of the demonstration. And at the time we were asking ourselves, are these people crazy? What kind of person wants to bomb a peace demonstration? We weren't carrying arms. We didn't understand them. Now, I got my answer 20 years later. Uh, but first, let me tell you about Enda McDonough, and I watch the time. Enda McDonough is a moral theologian in Ireland, and he's explored the meaning of peace. So my three points to quickly make, Sally, are the first is about what does peace mean? And McDonough traces the evolution of the word in the uh, Judeo-Christian Islamic uh, cultures uh, from the Hebrew word shalom, which means to live in balance within yourself, with other human beings and all of creation. McDonough describes peace understood through shalom as a flourishing of the human spirit. Now, when those scriptures were translated first into the Greek, we got the, the Greek word irene, which means harmony and order. And when they were translated into Latin, we got the word pax, which means legal order. So the doctrine in ancient Rome of Pax Romana was we will, we will declare to be peace what Rome says is peace. And from that we get the English word peace. So we have had in the world Pax Britannia, Pax Americana. We have had a, a, a political definition of what peace means. And I fear that the international community now has mortgaged itself to an understanding of peace which is more to do with PACs and, a, and an order that suits the international establishment. And back to 19, early, early 90s, I was traveling to a conference in America with a former member of the IRA, a gunman from the IRA, now retired. And we, I told him the story of the peace demonstration. He said, I remember that time well. Uh, whenever those peace demonstrations started, we asked permission to carry out more bombs and more shootings. I said, why? He says, because you were settling for something that wasn't really peace. The Brits were still in Ireland and Ireland was still divided. And I think of that when I've worked on UN missions to Afghanistan with people like the Taliban who do not recognize what the international community sees as peace. It to them looks like a pax and a problem for the UN as the eventual child of the vision of Carnegie is that it is very much controlled by the P5, the Security Council, and very political understandings of peace. So peace has been corrupted, and that is a challenge to organizations like Carnegie, how to promote the virtue of peace rather than a PACS-driven approach to it. The two other quick points are, uh, we are in an age of technocracy, 
A beautiful idea or vision is expressed. And then somehow the technocrats get hold of it and measurement comes in and bureaucracy comes in and it squeezes the life out of peace. So for me, how do we counter that? And for me, we counter it by promoting the spirituality of peace. And I don't mean religiosity. I mean, touching into the spirit of people. Somehow peace has lost its way and international organizations with the leverage of Carnegie have the potential to infuse more spirituality into uh, peace. And last point then, the third point, is I think we should not talk about peace any longer without talking also about the twin concept of reconciliation. In Northern Ireland, we had a very sophisticated peace agreement, the last big international peace settlement of the 20th century in the Good Friday Agreement. So 20 years ago, we had sophisticated structures for peace and they are failing. They are failing because although we got the structures of peace in our peace negotiations, we did not address the relationships at the core of it. And that's what reconciliation affirms. So for me, we have to try and marry those two concepts, peace and reconciliation. Thank you. Can I just ask you uh, to say a little bit more about spirituality, just what you meant by that? Yes. Um, well, I, I now, or as I was watching the children this afternoon, it was beautiful to, to listen to them. I'm sure you're all moved by it. But, but talking to young adults in this day and age at conferences like this, when I bring up spirituality, I have to reassure them I don't necessarily mean religion because it's such a bad word now for all sorts of reasons. But spirituality, whether you're religious or not, for me is a sense of the more, a sense that, that there is something more than what is obvious. And it's a dialogue within yourself, a sense of interiority where you reach into certain values. And I think that's the, some of the vision outlined by Professor Nassau was really a harking back and remembrance of values. Okay, thank you. So we've heard, we've heard from everybody um, and thank you for, for um, Oh, here's Mary. Oh, wonderful. How's your eye? Oh, oh dear. And the Dutch hospital system is just amazing. Oh. <laughs> well, welcome, welcome. I don't want to start, Mary, by uh, immediately putting you in the spot and, and asking you to speak, but if I can explain, we've, we've just heard from the... the the group of uh, Carnegie institutions here about what they're what they're doing now and how they're interpreting their original <laughs> remit from Andrew Carnegie, and we've heard from uh, Tom setting out some of his thoughts about peace and the need to reclaim the the idea of peace. And Brendan's just been talking about uh, his perspective as a um, a mediator in Northern Ireland, and I was going to come to you. Um, Tell me if you feel ready to speak immediately, um, but come to you just to give us a little bit of the background on how the whole um, dynamics of, of international um, peace and conflict have changed so much um, that, that everybody is running to, to try and catch up in, in almost every area. I should explain who you are, Mary, um, but I, I don't have that page of my notes to hand. I might get it wrong. Just, just give us a quick introduction oh, to so yourself. I'm Mary Caldor. I'm Professor of Global Governance at the London School of Economics. And for more years than I care to remember, I've been researching, writing, and talking about war and peace. So I hope I'm in the Carnegie tradition. <laughs> Absolutely. And, and just so, so briefly, and don't feel you have to give a sort of a talk on the subject, but, but what would you, what would, how would you sort of pinpoint the well, major themes? Well, what I thought of talking about was just the, the very dangerous moment that we're in at the present. And um, uh, I think sort of Carnegie ideals are needed more than ever. Um, I sort of tend to talk about what Gramsci called morbid symptoms. <laughs> Uh, and what he said by that was that the old is dying and the new can't be born. And in this interregnum, we see morbid symptoms. And the morbid symptoms are Trump, Putin, Brexit. Um, 
And I think that underlying this is that we're in a very big crisis moment. It's the end of the American model of development based on mass production, oil, the big role of the state. And it, in that sense, it's quite similar to the, 1920, the early 20th century when Carnegie was writing, which was the end of the British model <laughs> of development. And something else has to come and take its place in that's based on information and communications technologies that's green, that's global, but we haven't got there yet. We haven't got the right political institutions. And I think in previous periods like this, the whole problem was resolved through war. <laughs> War played this enormous restructuring role. It was hugely destructive, but it also restructured. And you can think about that in the second... I mean, the First World War, which is what Carnegie was concerned with, didn't restructure. It didn't inevitably restructure, and that led to the Second World War. But in the Second World War, we got massive redistribution of income. We got a shift from Britain to the United States as the sort of global leader. Um, and we got the spread, really, after the war of the American model of development. And now that's coming to an end. And I think the problem that we face now is that wars on the classic model are just impossible. We can't have a war, uh, an in, a new interstate war. <laughs> And even if we, it's just too destructive. If you think that 70 million people died in the Second World War, it, we just can't have that kind of war anymore. But not only that, but I think the whole problem is that states are actually rather anachronistic now, that we've had military competition in the Cold War, a kind of imaginary war that kept us going over the last 30 years. But actually, that is keeping us stuck in the old model. They're sort of anachronistic. <laughs> it's not going to lead us anywhere. But on the other hand, we do have a new type of war, and that's where I think the dynamics have really profoundly changed. I call it new wars, and you see it in Syria, Libya, the Balkans, Northern Ireland. But um, I think, you know, that we're seeing many of the symptoms in Europe and the United States as well. And the problem with this new kind of war is that it's not restructuring at all, it's the opposite. It's state unbuilding, it's hugely destructive, it's hugely disintegrative, it involves, it, 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 it thrives on disorder, and it's terribly difficult to end. We know these wars go on and on and on. And even where you get arbitration and mediation, the problem is these wars are fought by groups, sort of criminalized groups who espouse exclusivist identities. And the problem with arbitration is that it entrenches them. <laughs> Bosnia is the classic case. I mean, I think Northern Ireland's better, but even there, they're entrenched. But Bosnia is the classic case where everyone holds up Dayton as the ideal of a peace agreement, but actually, if you go to Bosnia today, it's like the war never ended. Yes, we've got less violence, but those criminal groups are totally entrenched. The country is completely dysfunctional. And I think half our, our problem is that we think of war as a deep-rooted political contest, which can be ended either by talks or by one side winning, whereas actually these kinds of wars are more like a social condition in which the varying warring, various warring parties benefit from violence itself rather than from winning or losing. They, they benefit from uh, economically and they, because they, they loot, they pillage, they can carry on criminal activities and they benefit politically because their extremist ideologies are based on fear. And the trouble with it, and then I'll come back to you, is that... Um, you know, that I think the right-wing populists we're seeing in Europe and America are a very similar type. They're not actually old-fashioned statist authoritarians. They're exclusivist. They want disorder. They want 
deregulation because that'll give them an opportunity to make money. <laughs> You know, I think if Britain... So, so I'm, yeah. I'm, I am sorry to interrupt you because I... I, I sorry, I went to, on I want too to long. I to bring the audience in and I also <laughs> want to... You know, we have captive here five excellent organisations devoted to, in various forms, um, peace building and yeah. how, you know, if we accept your your analysis, where where do the peace builders go in, in this enormously disrupted uh, landscape that you're talking about? Well, I think the peace builders have to think in new ways. <laughs> One of them is that rather than focusing on mediation between the warring parties, you have to focus on building up a counter-political uh, constituency, a counter-sectarian political institution. Now there's just... A sectarian political... Uh, alliance, if you like, aimed at rebuilding the legitimacy of institutions. So that's not, and, and then we could talk a lot about what kind of institutions. The second thing is the rule of law is hugely important. When we talk about security, it's not about defending borders against an enemy. It's about extending a rule of law and having justice. Um, I always say human security rather than national security. And then thirdly, the economic aspects are so important. There has to be economic redistribution. There has to be legitimate livelihoods for everybody. A lot of people all over the world get involved in these armed gangs and criminal gangs because they have no other form of livelihood. There has to be investment in climate change. Um, so we really do must realise that socio-economic measures are also peace measures. Thank you for that. So yes, absolutely. Uh, so, uh, thinking about the last of what you said, and looking at financing for peace, um, and in, in the United States, total giving was four hundred and ten million dollars, um, or billion, I should say. Um, international peace and security. Um, well, foundations of only of that 410 foundations um, contributed 16% of that. Um, for international peace and security, it's about 23 billion dollars. Um, so, how do we solve the you know, foundations and corporations and individuals can't go at this alone? And it's, it's not just the money. It's exactly what you said. It's the advocacy. It's it's the community. It's the building. It's what the kids said actually. So it's um, I don't know. You know, you have the peace, the financing for peace, but then you have the the, the wars that are financing wars. That's you know making more money yeah. than the peacemakers are. Absolutely. So. And I think, you know, the military industrial complex, which has now become in America in this sort of sinister war on terror complex involving private security contractors, intelligence agencies, special forces. And they're all making, their careers are invested in this. I mean, what, I, my, what I've been working on recently is this idea of security cultures. People are embedded in certain ways of doing security, and there's the old-fashioned geopolitical way, which is what absorbs most of the money. <laughs> but there is the liberal peace, which is sort of supported by the UN and the EU. And I think the liberal peace has always had the problem that it was always premised on a very old fashioned view of peace. It was premised on the idea that mediation and the peace agreement are the centerpiece of peace. And I think if it could shift in a more human security direction and start really acting in a convincing way in the conflicts we see in the world, and I think quite a lot's happening, for instance, in the European Union on these lines, then that would make an enormous difference if we could act, because our old-fashioned idea of security culture doesn't make any of us more secure. In fact, it has the opposite effect. It makes millions of people feel less secure. It doesn't solve the problem of terrorism. So we have to find a form of doing security that makes people feel secure, and that would be key in rebuilding the legitimacy of our public institutions. Is this word strong institutions that we just we just heard about earlier? So uh, the, the real question is, how do you make that transition? You mentioned the transition from World War II from the British to the U.S. Uh, and that was pretty straightforward, right? I mean, and but what, how do you imagine that kind of transition can occur 
um, you know, get, there, there isn't, not even the money. I mean, if you look at most countries, they're investing in their own interests. So the U.S., EU is still investing in, whether it's technology, whether it's investing in ways that are most beneficial to themselves. There's some of that, you know, that is, is clearly a, a driver. So how do you think about uh, globally making a transition to a system which is not necessarily based in nationality, not necessarily based in, in, in these strong institutions that have traditionally you know, well, you know what? I think the EU is a very interesting institution. It may well disintegrate. <laughs> um, but if it survives, it's not actually a state in the making. I think it's potentially a kind of model of the kind of global governance that we need. And what I'm talking about is that we need a kind of layer of political institutions above the nation state, which doesn't substitute for the nation state, but it deals with global bads <laughs> like war, climate change, and it promotes global goods. I mean, obviously the UN is one of those, but the EU is potentially a very effective form and one could imagine other regional forms. So how do we get there? Because the problem with the EU at the moment is that it's dominated by market fundamentalism, which is having disastrous consequences. I think it's very much a matter of political pressure yeah, so, but and transnational political pressure. Is there a strategy, given the independence of the Carnegie institutions and the resources, <laughs> to, to invest in that kind of a future? I mean, that's kind of the basic question here. Are there things that we can do as institutions to invest in the right, to, to make the right kind of bets, you know, just call it research. So, you know, yeah. I'm a physicist, so I would say, is there is there a model out there that works and can we move toward that model, at least test the model out with... I mean, Tom, with, uh, as I understood it, your, your whole thesis was about looking at the Carnegie institutions to see whether there might be ways in which they could adapt to to the, the, the new realities that have been described here. Um, does your silence suggest that there isn't one? <laughs> well, I mean, um, I, I have to be careful as a Carnegie employer, employees. I mean, s suggesting that there needs to be a, a total rethink, and that my boss is doing my bosses are doing the wrong job because clearly, clearly they're not. But, um, but, but sure, I, I do think um, I, I, I certainly to pick up on Mary's point. I think that um, a lot of societies around the world are not in a state of old-fashioned conflict where, arm, where you know, armed groups are facing each other on battlefields, but they have, they've, they've partially disintegrated thanks to all sorts of pressures, um, economic, social pressures, and, and the international environment they're in. And I think um, the Carnegie institutions are very well placed with their kind of intellectual capacity and, and global reach to, to be kind of looking at innovative ways of dealing with those those kind of situations. Um, uh, Thomas and, and John, I know you, you wanted to come in, do you? Really briefly on this issue of, of institutions and the durability and the malleability thereof. It may seem a bit technical and I apologize to those in the audience. Who, who, who want us to move on to other issues, but I think it's, it's a hugely important issue. It goes back to your point earlier on peace being different from Pax, uh, because if I understand you correctly, the, what you're arguing is that uh, as long as a sufficient amount of the right people view the current order, the Pax, as unfair, peace will not follow, this order will break out. The same applies to institutions. You could, you could take your point and, and, and Mary's point on on the need to trans transform the institutions. Uh, I think they add up to the same thing. Carnegie Endowment has been on the story in some ways. That's a point that's, that's been recognized already. We have had people who argued passionately for the need to reform the international, the institutions of international finance and banking for a more inclusive IMF, for a more inclusive uh, World Bank, specifically because we worried that these institutions important to stability, perhaps not in a physical security sense, but in certainly in, a, in, a, in an important area, unless they are reformed, they will succumb to the pressure from the countries, the challengers from the outside who don't think they have sufficient power and influence. So the point is well absorbed and well taken on board. What we have found is, of course, that it's very, very difficult to do politically. Um, and to state the obvious, Turkeys don't vote for Christmas, and big 
powers don't, don't willingly give up power and influence within the big international institutions. So we run into essentially the political limits of what institutions such as Carnegie can do. It's, it's become very difficult, if not impossible, to get the, the large governments to move on the issue of a more inclusive uh, World Bank, more inclusive IMF. And I fear as a result, what you're finding is, is happening is, is, an, is unraveling in some ways of the global institutions uh, with rival institutions being set up in different parts of the world. So in many ways, a self-defeating outcome to what was a fairly narrow-minded policy decision not to enlarge IMF and World Bank memberships. John, John do you see a, a, a way ahead? I think so. Um, uh, I, I wanted to reflect on something else that one of the young students said earlier this afternoon about trust needing to be earned, uh, because across our institutions and across uh, political parties uh, are in a range of countries, we are seeing really strong evidence about a progressive decline of trust. Uh, so for me, uh, the, a prior question to what institutions can we build is how do we reverse that process of decline of trust? And that seems to me to be uh, related to paying more attention to releasing the voices of communities and making sure that uh, we combat marginalisation uh, within, uh, within, within our societies, because it's, it's only when institutions are in a genuine dialogue with citizens that you can expect uh, a, a revival of trust. And I think there is work that the Carnegie institutions and a range of others can do uh, to restore the voice of communities uh, to, um, uh, to combat uh, marginalisation, and I think that if we uh, if we make a sustained effort on that front, we will we will see some amelioration of the damaging forces that we've been discussing. Joel, yeah, if I could just speak to that. This gets to the um, the theme of education for peace, so that people feel like they have some voice in the process. Many of you will be familiar with a uh, recent poll that was published in the Journal of Democracy. A uh, poll of young people, I think uh, millennials, those born after 1980, uh, only 30% said that it, it was essential to live in a democracy. Meaning 70% of those born after nine, 1980 either don't think it's important or don't care or don't know. Um, but that is a huge issue, I think, for everything that we're discussing here. Um, I'll just call your attention to one other branch of the Carnegie philanthropy, which was libraries. I um, mean, I do think uh, something for us to think about over these next couple of days, these two things are related. Uh, libraries and education, it's essential for democracy, it's essential for the building of values, it's essential, essential for intellectual formation. And without giving people the opportunity to think uh, for themselves, um, many of these conversations uh, will not be very successful. It gets back to David's point about top-down versus bottom-up. So I would just like for us as we move ahead to uh, be thinking about uh, what are we teaching? Uh, what, do people, what do young people know about the world they're living in? Um, I just want to put in one other word, which is a um, hundred years ago this week uh, was really the beginning of the end of World War I. The Meuse-Argonne Offensive began on September 26, 1918. Um, that would be over in about a week, and then a month later the war would, would end. Um, and I wonder how many young people know that story, um, and if they do know that story, what they think about it, um, and how it might inform the world that we're living in today. I use that as just one small data point. I just think the literacy issue, the education issue, and we now have the means to mount a global scale education effort on peace. Something to think about. Thank you. Let me ask for questions, yes. If you've got a question, could you raise your hand and we'll get, uh, there is one roving mic um, somewhere. Right, could we start uh, with the lady in the second row, please? And if you'd like to uh, stand up and give your, your name and your organization, if you wouldn't mind. Thank you. I'm uh, Laura Reinders. I'm from Initiatives of Change, Netherlands. Initiatives of Change is a global movement, uh, 90 years old. And um, education very much resonates with me. I uh, recently gave uh, a small course uh, called your, Strengthening Your Democratic Skills. So not politics, but 
just how can I be more listening into everyday conversations? How do I make decisions with my friends, with my parents, at my work? And someone said, or eventually the group said they were all in their 20s, said to me like, yeah, better a good dictatorship than a bad democracy. And I was really shocked because it's the third day of the course and I was like, ouch. So how do we get people to be more resilient? I think change and disorder is going to happen. Complexity is a new normal. So how do we get into education more resilience, more coping with this? And how do we get uh, to teach our children like skills to cope with it? Thank you very much. Who would like to... Who would like to take that? I'll just take very, very quickly. I do think that um, the way we teach these things has, has to evolve. I'm delighted we saw the example this, this, uh, earlier this afternoon. I think it has to be more interactive. I think that young people want to participate in some way. They don't want to just listen and learn, perhaps in ways that um, have been done in the past. But that, that key word, resilience, Ginny. Just to tap into that a little bit, and again, this is going to go back to, to funding and money. Um, we can, if we just go back to the Reagan era, um, they were defunding a lot of nonprofits. And because of that, the left got really good at advocacy. And then the right decided, wow, they're really making some really good points here. We're going to do the same. But they don't want to know any, who they are. They don't want you to know. So today, just fast forward now, we have the issues with donor advised funds, the dark money that's out there. They're pushing it out to social media. So the message is, so for education, it's really hard for people to be, become educated in the right way. What's the truth? What is not the truth? Why are we so pessimistic? Why can't we talk about positive issues? What, what are the positive issues? And so there's this convergence of dark and, and left and right. And so it's really, I, I can't imagine being a, a young person in a university now, and I ask students, like, what are you learning? What are you talking about? How do you deal with this? How do you deal with social media? You know, where you go, Twitter, Facebook? And so that's what we need to look at as well. Yes, yeah, sorry. Yeah, I just wanted to say that I think we have to talk more about economic and social issues. I mean, I was very much involved in the events that led up to the 1989 revolution when we were campaigning for democracy. And we were the post-war generation that took social justice for granted. When I retrospectively think about the 1989 revolutions, what I realize is the reason the communists gave in so quickly is that communist bureaucrats realized they could become capitalists and swap their political positions for economic wealth. And most people in Eastern Europe experience democracy as growing inequality, loss of social benefits, um, and the figures show it, rising infant mortality, lower life expectancy, and Actually, they didn't really get much democracy because of we live in a globalized world and there was only one economic recipe for them all which the communists embraced. And that goes back to why we need to really press on economic and social rights as well as civil and political rights. Thank you very much. Another question. Yes, there's, there's lots and lots. One here and then if you'd like to pass the microphone two rows back, there's a gentleman there. Um, thank, thanks a lot. Um, and, uh, Hank Jan Brinkman, the Peace Building Support Office in the Secretary General's uh, uh, UN Secretariat. So the Secretary General is, I think, really uh, making uh, a point of making the shift that, that Mary is talking about. Um, and in a way, the, the vision of, of Andrew Carnegie has been realized because in 19, uh, early 19th century, it was war between states. They rarely happen anymore. They almost disappeared, um, if not totally. Um, you can argue for for example, about Ukraine or not, whether that's an interstate war or a civil war. But the changing characteristics of the war is so important because the traditional instruments of the UN, mediation, facilitation, arbitration, and peacekeeping operations, don't work in these situations as, as well as they did during the Cold War in Southern Africa, Mozambique, Angola, Central America. So we need to really switch that 
set of instruments that we have to a much broader set of instruments. Because the drivers of, of civil wars are multifaceted and multidimensional and changing over time. They are amorphous, they are difficult to determine. And so I totally agree with Mary that um, we need to bring in the development side. Peace builders are not the people who sit in the political department or in peacekeeping operations. The pe every single UN staff member needs to be a peace builder. That is really what we need to do. And making sure that we use the development goals, and not only goal 16, that by the way, 36 targets among the 169 targets that really have a peace component, whether it's they're talking about justice or inclusivity. And we need to use the whole set of agenda of the 2030 agenda to create the address the drivers of, of violent conflict in, in countries that are struck by civil war. Thanks. Thank you. Uh, Brendan, do you agree with that? Yes, I want to point out that um, while, the U while the UN has been overhauling its approach to peace and emphasising collaboration bet between the three pillars of the UN, between peace and security, human rights and development, which, which goes towards something of what Mary is speaking about. Before you come in, Mary, I was setting out a vision of peace which was more holistic than mere political peace that suits powers. And so I think, again, if we understand peace as the restoration of balance, then there's a huge imbalance on the globe between the Northern Hemisphere and the Southern Hemisphere. I think that another thing to factor in is the age of social media and the internet. And the wave of uh, migration that we see now coming out of Africa uh, is in part to do with the collapse of states like Libya, but it's also a new generation of Africans who, through the social power, the power of social media, can see what the, what the developed world has. And they're saying, we want some of that. We're not going to stay here waiting in a queue for your charity trucks to arrive. We're coming. We want some of that. And that, that is a deeply... A challenging political threat to the established powers of the world. Uh, and yet, if, if we want peace, that is a difficult issue they're going to have to face up to. And I think mention, the mention of the Sustainable Development Goals may be the key, the factor for this century, uh, which somehow uh, 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 imparts to the, uh, the selfishness of the world an understanding that the only future the planet has is one where we actually work together for the environment. That may in time overcome some of the ideological or even self-interest that blocks to it. But one last point about mediation. We need to think more broadly about the use of mediation. Um, we need to understand it as a tool of conflict transformation, not just conflict resolution. And the traditional approach to mediation is too narrow. It waits un uh, until there's just a, a, a political elite around a table the UN is beginning to articulate, as is the EU, a vision of mediation which was, is much more holistic and comprehensive, uh, uh, and as is its approach to peace. The problem I see with that is that while the UN and EU uh, subscribe to the rhetoric of comprehensive peace, their practice, their operational practice is still old style and conventional, and it's more around diplomacy. Thank you very much. Um, your question. Hi, I'm, I'm Julian. I'm... Uh, well, I'm a member of the Carnegie Club of St. Andrews and currently a master's student. And trying to sort of build on what has been said a lot, we have, been talked, we have talked about how there was an established world order, the Pax Britannica, Pax Americana, and how, you know, for a long time we've been very used to the system, the system of institutions that were largely founded by Western countries and that in the end were guaranteeing a form of stability, so to say, um, that we got used to and that we know today. Now, today we speak about the instability of a lot of things. We talk about a new kind of non-state actors that are causing conflict. We're talking about the G0 world that Ian Bremmer always talks about how there is not only one country or a couple of superpowers that can wield influence in parts of the world. But my question would really be, besides peace, which is kind of a, the ultimate goal uh, that we're talking about here, like what are ways to reintroduce a degree of stability into this ever more instable system that we are faced with that is actually being in destabilized by a lot of different factors, be it migration, be it social media, be it um, you know, disparity in wealth, and corporations um, having influences in different countries in the world. So really, what are ways that we can try to make this more resilient? What are ways we can try to make this more stable, even though it may be a world, without reestablishing the idea of there being one world power that sort of controls that everything is in order? Thank you. Mary. Actually, I wanted to come back to something earlier. I agreed with everything, but I'll come to you. I agreed with everything you said, except I think it's a misnomer to treat today's wars as civil wars. I think they're global. 
And uh, that's part of our problem, that we treat them as civil wars. And I, we haven't yet talked about what the Russians call political technology, <laughs> which is sort of involvement through social media and stirring up trouble through social media. But I think that's an incredibly important aspect. I work a lot on Syria. And Syria's the only conflict I've ever been involved in, which is completely covered by mobile networks. And so the amount of information that is poured at you, which you can't understand because it's just too much, is just incredible. We have more data than we ever had ever about the Syrian conflict, and yet we don't know how to understand and use it. So turning from that. So all of these conflicts are global and the economic problems are global. It's just, you know, you might get a wonderfully progressive government in one country that really wants to change things, but their possibilities for doing things are very, very limited because actually who controls their economies are multinational co corporations, the financial markets, and so on and so forth. So we do need to operate at global levels. I also think we need very much to start thinking about how do we deal with the problems of political technology? What kind of regulation do we need for the big internet companies? That's a very urgent task. And, and to take Julian's specific question about you know, where you find new stability. Well, what I feel is that you find, I, I mean, it's always been my approach to understanding contemporary wars. You always find areas of stability within contemporary wars, even in Syria, areas where local people have negotiated to keep out of the wars. And the problem with the international community, I think, or in America, there's lots of Trumpism, but there's some wonderful cities that are accepting migrants and doing all sorts of things. And um, the trouble with m the international community is they focus on the bad areas. <laughs> Wouldn't If they started focusing on the good areas, the islands, I call them islands of civility, <laughs> the areas where there is stability, how to protect them, how to prevent them from being invaded by the bad things, how to make possible their expansion, that might be a different way of doing it. And you just, it always is extraordinary to me in every conflict I've been in, you find the most extraordinary people doing the most extraordinary things in trying to create peace, trying to help their local communities. And the UN and the EU love those people. They'll give them lots of money. But the problem isn't money. The problem is political. And that's what we're not very good at. We think they're very nice, but unimportant. But actually, they're the answer. Last quick question. Uh, oh, <laughs> take your pick. Sorry. <laughs> Hello, my name is Eleni Theodorou and I work for the Hague Humanity Hub. Um, we are a community of innovators for peace, justice and humanitarian action. And I'm very happy that you just mentioned data. This is what I missed from all this conversation actually, innovation for peace. Um, there is all this new wave of innovators that they work with data analysis, machine learning and other technologies but also new processes. And the other thing I missed was how do we better use the value chains of big companies to create public-private partnerships to accelerate our efforts. We see Nespresso working in Colombia doing post-conflict uh, programs and supporting the economy, creating a different environment. Yes, for their benefit, but also to develop um, and help the community to get out of illicit crops. So for me, I would like to see our community to be updated and really work with what is out there, use the value chains and do better. Yeah. Okay, thank you very much. I want to just um, finish off by asking um, you and the, the Carnegie side whether you feel that there's anything that you might be doing together more to tackle some of this. I mean, you're all individually obviously doing magnificent work in your own areas, and yet there is such a resource together, perhaps to think through some of these issues that, that you, Mary and Joe, you talk so passionately about in terms of uh, education and, and where you need to start. Well, I would just say as, as a voice, I mean, the Carnegie name 
I hesitate to use a business marketing term, but brand, sorry about that. But um, I do think um, as, as we look around, you know, a trusted, the word trust is important um, source of um, ideas, people, network, um, much like the Carnegie libraries, you know, people went there to learn um, and they, in, you know, they, they trusted it in a certain way. So I think there's something there that we collectively can build on that we share in the DNA of our organization. What would it look like, a new model of Carnegie's working together, Eric? Colleagues is here in the audience, Adam Michalak, she's going to be speaking tomorrow, who does environmental studies using data. And, you know, scientists will attack the most important problems out there. So one area, which actually is going on more even at universities now, and the Carnegie could form this kind of coalition. If you look at a place like University of Chicago, you have people who are economists working closely with people who are energy scientists or energy technologists. The real question is, what are the important problems? So you just mentioned Syria. We don't know anything about it yet. We have tons of data. That's a really interesting statement. So here I think there are maybe opportunities, um, you know, modulo funding availability and all that to do you know, what are the important problems? Certainly, Carnegie Institution for Science has not addressed peace directly, only in this more indirect fashion of trying to solve the food problem or solve the water problem, which is technology problem, solve the data problem. With good problems to solve, there may be opportunities to combine the social science, the social aspects of what you do, data science, and real hard technology science, right? And these are all integrated in a really deep way, and can't, they're inextricably linked. You can't get away from the water problem you know, clean water is inextricably linked to, to the problem, you know, climate change, clearly. Water, sea, sea level rise, storm, you know, much more extreme. So that kind of thing, if you have good problems to solve that are societal, there's a good partnership to be made, I think. So, so do you feel you, you, you have an inkling, as you're hearing all this, <laughs> of, a, of a future direction, Thomas? <laughs> Absolutely. And let me answer it in a way that also addresses Eleni's question on where is the innovation. It's, I think, precisely in this space and on technology where I see potentially real new room for cooperation. Let me assure you that we already recognize innovation and technology in particular as the big new area for at least our Carnegie Institution to look into. Not just a future talk, we have already set up a technology program. You will hear us tomorrow uh, hold a panel on the importance and the impact of artificial intelligence on the world of uh, diplomacy and war and international affairs. We regard technology as both a helper. It's been hugely good and beneficial that we can use technology to do things such as set the record straight on MH17, a very important story in this country, of course. It's also obvious, to state the obvious, a disruptor. Um, we worry, for example, we have colleagues in Washington and Palo Alto working on getting governments to cooperate and agree a compact where they will not put malicious technology into uh, things like chips and circuitry and other things fancy term for its integrity of supply, um, uh, but that an important issue in international affairs. And But the thing we're running up against, and this is where I get to the point of cooperation, is that it requires a lot of scientific knowledge. Even the best so policy experts run up against the limits of, oh, there's only so much I know about circuitry, only so much I know about chips. So this brings me to the point on cooperation. I'm making a mental note to work particularly with our colleagues in the science space and, and find out what is there, what potential for cross-fertilization. We reach out to technology companies and also to address your second point, we work with technology companies. We don't call them public-private partnerships, but in a partnership all the time. Perhaps we need to strike up more of a partnership with our fellow Carnegie institutions. Is there some sort of pan-Carnegie organization that needs to be set up here? You can pay for it. You can pay for it, Jeannie. Yeah. So, no, so just to, um, the end of last year, was at the beginning of this year, we met at Joel's office, a number of the Carnegie folks, to talk about, um, in, in, 20, in 2019 will be the centennial of Andrew Carnegie's death, and how can the Carnegie institutions work more collaboratively? And what, what are the themes that we could, how can we work together? And um, we talked about, we didn't, you know, like, do we honor his legacy? And then Joel came up and he said, you know, why don't we look at looking at the future? And we put together a, a one year, one and a half year plan called, as, uh, the umbrella name is Brand, Forging the Future, where the Carnegie institutions have spread out over time various events um, highlighting our work that how it intersects with others. So for example, in April, was it April? Or, yes. Yeah, April, 
Carnegie Corporation of New York and the Carnegie Council, we, we met, we, we launched the initiative at the Carnegie Council um, to talk about uh, Andrew Carnegie's legacy and forging the future and what, what, what we would look like as our, as our institutions grow into the future. And the second one was held in Pittsburgh and that was the power of one where they honored the 10,000th hero. And all, I, many people in this room were there in Pittsburgh. And so the more we gather and the more we learn about our work, the more we can collaborate. And that's what we're, that's what we're striving, uh, what we're striving to do. Joel, do you want to add to that? Or? No, I, I guess I just to underline it, I do think that um, this does give us the opportunity, this 100 year anniversary mm -hmm. to um, not only take stock Reset. of, um, as David was saying, you know, um, what Andrew Carnegie got right, what he got wrong, what can we learn? but to think really hard about the next 100 years. It's a little overwhelming to think about 100 years, but that's, you know, that's our responsibility. And I do think we have an opportunity, particularly in the peace area, where there are several institutions working alongside um, to work together for some sort of joint program. Okay, yeah. and uh, a last word, very quick last word from our three here. What, what would you most want our Carnegie people here to take away from these three days of peace building conversations? What's the most useful thing for the world going forward that uh, you could invite them to do? Well, I, I'm sure many people here are familiar with the thinking of the American sociologist, John Paul Lederach. He, he preaches the importance of developing what he calls a moral imagination. And the idea is that you should try to create networks of people, uh, bring them into relationship, deepen the relationship and feed their creativity. And out of their creativity will come risk because people have to take risks. So I would hope that the Carnegie family will use its resources to feed the moral imagination around the globe by bringing more and more strategically placed people, young and older, into conversations that enable them to become more influential. And I would say Carnegie needs to avoid authority, just seek influence. Thank you very much. Uh, Tom, briefly? I mean, I think it's all been said. I think, um, you know, um, deepen the conversation, broaden the networks, um, focus, you know, this idea. I, th I think human security um, is, is a key concept that we should be taking out of, out, out of these conversations, okay. that peace has human security, not just, um, you know, security in the, in the old 20th, 19th century. Thank you, and Mary. I was going to say very much the same thing. I agree both with both of you. We need to kindle the moral imagination. Um, and I think at the heart, and I think at the heart of that is rethinking what we mean by peace. I think rethinking what we mean by peace is really about having a global rule of law. <laughs> That's absolutely crucial, underpinned by a new set of institutions of which institutions like the UN and the EU are models. So, you know, how to press for those and how to build the research, and there have been some wonderful suggestions about the crossover between science and social science, about the need to think about social media, and of course, as I keep emphasizing, how to deal with criminality, how to create legitimate livelihoods, but all of those are part of what we would mean by establishing a global rule of law. Well, thank you very much. As, as these guys go off to kindle their moral imaginations, um, I thank you all for your contributions and indeed for these very, um, very interesting and, and uh, thought-provoking um, comments from the audience as well. Thank you so much. And it sets us up nicely for, for us going deeper into some of the, the um, issues around contemporary build, peace building in tomorrow's sessions. But in the meantime, um, I hope you'll all uh, join us now for a reception. We have a, a walking dinner, as it's called, and music in the entrance hall. And I'll look forward to seeing you all again here tomorrow morning. Bye-bye. Thank you. Thank you.